Hey there, ghosties. Welcome to episode 76 of the Ghost Lights podcast. This evening, we sat down with an idol of mine and for the first time, a co-star, Chris Kendall. We talked about the experience of working on Land of Milk and Honey that the Catamounts is putting on at Schoenberg Farm this summer. And his experiences in general, like learning about theater, the way it came to him, and how it grew over his time working in New York specifically, and the childlike enthusiasm necessary to keep it going. This conversation was really fun and really grounded, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed the experience of sitting on the other side of this camera for the, hopefully, last time. Maybe we go live the next time you hear us. You never know. Now, Dan, give us war by the Hypnotic Brass Ensemble. This is episode 76 of the Ghost Lights Podcast. We are steadily making our way to that big triple digits 100. And today, what better way to get back in the swing of things than with a stalwart, a tradition of Colorado theater, Chris Kendall. Chris, how are you, sir? I'm very well. Thank you. <laughs> good, good. Um, I have been, I've had the great pleasure of finally getting an opportunity to work with you we're doing a show together for the Catamounts, which sadly, for those of you at home who haven't gotten your ticket tickets yet, has been sold out since Jump Street. But Land of Milk and Honey by Jeffrey Newman is going off like gangbusters. Wouldn't you say so? I would say so, yes, from yes. what I've heard and experienced. Yes. Yeah. How, how has this experience been for you? It's been great. Yeah. Really. Um, uh, as you know, I have fewer lines than anyone in the cast, but um, I have uh, an, a couple of very crucial scenes that, uh, to me, are really rewarding. Hmm. They're very, very emotional and very, uh, how should I say, kind of spiritual. Hmm. And I hope I'm not being too self-indulgent with them, <laughs> people have given me uh, compliments, uh, you know, but I wonder sometimes if I'm not just milking it more than, than uh, is uh, strictly required. Mm. But I really love the part. I love the character and the, uh, the writing, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Newman's writings, really kind of transcendent. I mean, he says a lot in very few words. And mm. so I've really been enjoying it. What, what are some of the things that you relate to, um, to your character of Louis Schoenberg? Well, there's a, there's a, a deep melancholy mm -hmm. in the man because of his loss of his son. And it's the, the reason why he has funded this farm to feed consumptives at... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, National Jewish Hospital, because his son died of consumption, and in fact, his his wife did as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a bit trite to say that life is about loss, mm. but I think that's very true, and that that is what he is dealing with. He is trying to fill a, a void in his heart, and the play somewhat magically allows him to do that. It, it takes a, a turn, might be called magical realism, mm -hmm. but it takes a spiritual turn in which he is, he is able to uh, reach a point of harmony and peace mm -hmm. about his loss. I have a... Uh, I have a I have a question for you in regards to what I think you're pinpointing in terms of a moment in the play. And, and if you feel like it's spoiling anything, we don't have to put this in the pod, but I do want to know, do you feel like 
the yard site at the end is like the first time Lewis in your eyes has said those words and gone through that experience since his son passed away? I don't know. I, I think, I think not because it's been some years mm -hmm. and as an observant Jew, he, he, I think he, uh, sell a, he, he, he holds a yard site, mm -hmm. which is a, a Yiddish term from the German meaning years time. Yeah. It's an anniversary of his son's death. And I, I'm sure he has held a yard site for his son okay. before this happens. But um, I believe this is the first time that his son shows up for mm. him. I don't yeah. mean to spoil anything either. Maybe <laughs> we should back up here. So yeah, that that is... Well, uh, for my character, that's the crux of the, the whole piece. Absolutely. And uh, um, the way that Jeffrey wrote it is so economical. The crisis takes place in about five words, which are spaced apart, generously spaced, mm -hmm. but involve uh, a whole movement for an actor is a, is a, a real luxury. It's yeah. like, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. I, I probably already said too much. <laughs> well, anyway. it's, we're, we're, we're going to be dropping this, like the, the, the beginning of our last week. So I think, I, I think we'll be, I think we'll be okay, but we'll definitely look at that section. Um, but I, I'm, I'm glad you, you bring it up. I, I wondered for me what the experience has been like is I've done the last couple of shows for the Catamounts for the city of Westminster and that relationship. I've been mm -hmm. fortunate enough to do that, but this is the first time it's really kind of asked me to spend a lot of time engaging with the audience and almost treating them like a character in the piece. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you had experience doing that before this particular no. show? No, not to this extent. Mm. Um, I have never done a play in which it was possible mm -hmm. even for me to look every member of the audience in the eyes. That experience makes it so immediate and personal. Um, it's, again, as I said, it's a great luxury mm -hmm. to, it's, uh, breaking the fifth wall in a radical way. Um, it's as if you're doing, uh, doing a show for your closest relations, people who know you mm -hmm. in a way where we are assuming that these people know us as well as our own kin and treating them like that. So it's really extraordinary in that way. Do you find did you find that difficult letting the audience in to that degree? Oh no, not at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a private person. I don't, you know, I, I uh, in theater, I think I find the greatest intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I find access to the deepest feelings that I have, but also a greater intimacy with, with other people, particularly strangers, mm -hmm. than I have uh, normally. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this play is kind of the, the uh, epitome of that. It is, for me, ver very much immersive theater. It's not just immersive for the audience. It's immersive for me. Mm. because uh, I have not experienced a play, I've not experienced a creation of a character that so much involves the audience as this one does. Do you feel that the audience informs any of your choices in the moment? Very much so. They're not big choices. It's not like I'm going to say something different mm -hmm. because of who's there or what they're... <laughs> doing yeah 
you know, unless they're trying to take flash photographs and I might interrupt them and say that's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but who would, would do be... that there though? That's, that's weird. We've seen who would do that. Yes. <laughs> um, but certainly, I mean, the, the reaction I get when I'm looking at people informs my state of mind very much mm. in, the, in the moment during that yard site scene. So I, can, I cannot say really how much it, it, would, it would affect the performance mm -hmm. because of course I'm saying the same words. Yeah. But it certainly affects the, uh, the depth of my own feeling about it. Hmm. I wonder, uh, one of the things that I've encountered and, and I'm sure I'm not alone during this process or any one that's ever done immersive theater when you have to engage with the audience on a consistent basis. Is the, I, for me, I can only speak for in this regard, the kind of uh, shot to the, the ego in the moment when they're not, when they like, when they're definitely watching me do my monologue or whatever, and then I engage with them and their eyes dart to the floor or they decide to put themselves into a phone or a watch. Like, have you encountered stuff like that during this show? And what does that do to you in the moment? Um, yes, I, it is a, it's a curious thing. I don't know how much I want to describe how this moment unfolds. Yeah. But I am looking each person in the eye so by the time I've done four or five of them, they know what's coming. Mm -hmm. They know I'm going to look at them uh, mm -hmm. if it's only for a second or two. And some people grow fidgety about that. You yeah. know, they, they will look around, they will look down. There's never been one who has not at least looked up at me for a moment. And I try to be as tender a feeling as I can for those people mm -hmm. when I know that this is not comfortable for them because mm -hmm. I know what that feels like. I, what I strive for is to give everyone the same look because I'm playing a character. Yeah. I, you know, my character has a point of view. My character is looking around and suddenly not knowing who these people are, he's with. Mm -hmm. And so I give them a searching look, unless they are obviously uncomfortable with that. And then I just give them as kind a look as I can. I'll tell you, it's extraordinary for me, this type of acting. Yeah. I've never done it before. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you were so candid with me about this process from that perspective. I mean, when, like I said, for me, it's like, I've, I've been doing this since like 2007 and there've been instances where I've been allowed to quote unquote, break the fourth wall, but for some of it to like, some of these moments to kind of be hanging on the audience's participation, it's, it's really unique and a, a struggle. So, I mean, and I've, like, I've, I feel like I'm scratching the surface still at acting. Um, and I consider you to be a, a quality veteran of the game. So thank you. That now brings me to the question that kind of kicks it all off. <laughs> Chris, theater, how did it happen to you? Um. I have an older brother, John. He's two years older than I. So he was in high school two years before I was. And uh, at our high school, which is Cathedral High School in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. a Catholic high school, we had a speech and drama teacher, Helen Barak, who was an extraordinary woman, a very dramatic person. <laughs> she immediately took to John, my brother, and uh, insisted that he go to speech meets where he would do humorous interpretation. And he'd bring home ribbons because he, he was winning these contests. And so 
naturally, that that was what I was going to do when I went to high school. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to speech meets. I was going to win prizes, and I did. Uh, I even used his material. <laughs> <laughs> we had to do a ten-minute cutting from a from a, a you know a novel or whatever. Mm. Uh, and uh, I entered in humorous interpretation, and I immediately started winning ribbons, trophies. Mm. They started giving out trophies at this time. This was the beginning <laughs> of the real. Uh, I don't know what the what the term is for it, where everybody had to had to be validated to the max for yeah. their efforts. And uh, so <laughs> the year I started, they started giving out trophies. I would go around to other high schools in the city and uh, using the same material at every speech meet, I would win uh, trophies. And uh, when I was a sophomore, uh, a director at Bonfies Theater, a director of children's theater, called my teacher, Helen Barak, and asked her if she had anyone who could handle the part of Jack. In Jack and the Beanstalk. And she said, yes, sent me down there. And I got the part. Mm. And there I was on the stage at Bonfies Theater when it was, at, you know, the one on Colfax and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. plush seats, you know, big lobby, huge fly area, scenic. Uh, shop and everything. Henry Lowenstein was the scenic designer at the time. Mm -hmm. I, this was like 1966. Wow. Um, and I had the lead part in this show. It was a very heady experience for a kid mm -hmm. my age. And even if I hadn't already, already decided that that's what I wanted to do, I was confirmed in that belief at that point. And uh, so I went to, you know, I went on to college, studied theater arts, and uh, I had a number of different careers. I mean, I did a lot of stuff mm. for money, uh, always respectable stuff, of course. Uh -huh. Of course, of course. Um, what were some but, of your hustles? Oh, let's see. I mean, my, the earlier hustles were, of course, washing dishes and stuff, you yeah. know. Um, but, uh, when I, I went to, uh, well, I started working as a draftsman mm -hmm. in the oil and gas interest industry that paid pretty well. And then, uh, when I, I moved out to San Francisco and I worked as, a, an artist in a, at a t-shirt shop, <laughs> you know, we were printing t-shirts with your your choice of design mostly we did designs for rock concerts and stuff went to new york and worked as a paste up artist for a magazine and then got a job my, my friend don got me a job as a, a programmer this was 1983 i think the first ibm pc had just come out yeah. and the company he was working for had a contract to produce a program for real estate brokers on the PC. Nobody had had a PC before this happened. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to have the first application for real estate brokers on, on the PC. So that's, I just got started working as a programmer. After about eight years of that, I went to school at NYU night classes to get a degree in uh, computer, I forget what it was called, computer, it wasn't computer science, it was mm. just software, something. Development, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I stuck with that for about 35 years, all the time, wow. still going to, you know, auditions. The main thing that happened, though, in New York was I mm. found a, an acting teacher. Oh. Uh, my friend Ruth Lawyer had a had a teacher. She said you should come and study with Dennis. He's great. And I went to study with Dennis, and Dennis showed me just how bad an actor I was. <laughs> but <laughs> he did it 
in a way that didn't hurt. Uh, he showed me just what I was doing wrong, just what I wasn't doing. And uh, it was, it changed my life, you know. He had an approach uh, that was, of course, very internal. It was, you know, you're not an actor unless what you're doing comes from the heart, unless it, it uh, moves you. Mm -hmm. You can't move anyone else if you're pretending to be moved. I call it the difference between pretend and make believe. Mm. Everyone knows that children instinctively know how to make believe and they do it sincerely. They do it because they have to do it. It's their, the way they train themselves to be adults, which to a child is of the most vital importance to become an adult. So they make believe they're adults and they do it sincerely. Their acting is impeccable. And when people grow up, they lose that because it's childish. They have to lose it. Mm. They're, they're ridiculed if they don't lose it. Yeah. The people who don't lose it become actors. <laughs> That's my theory. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, uh... There's a lot of, I mean, one of the, I, I, I latch on to what you just said, because one of the things that I was do notoriously at the earlier stages of my career was this censoring of what I was feeling because mm -hmm. I felt it was either too ridiculous or too emotional. Too it was revealing. Yeah. But the bottom line is too revealing. Exactly. And so I would, find ways to like work around it and it wasn't until i met an acting teacher that kind of gave me permission to explore that did i feel like oh this is what i should have been doing years ago it feels more it feels more rewarding when it is so exploratory and vulnerable if that mm -hmm. Does that translate right? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, when we're younger and we're we're acting from our heads, mm -hmm. we we get by because we're demonstrative and we're loud about it, you know. Sure. And we we're expressive and you know, <laughs> say, "Look at me, mm -hmm. I'm," you know. Yeah. There, like in 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 high school or college or whatever. So many people are just, you know, they get up there and they're feeling kind of timid. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, do much, you know, the, and the ones who, the, who stand out are those who say, here I am, mm -hmm. whether they're doing the, doing it uh, well or not. If you're standing out there and just, you know, putting yourself on the line, you're a much better actor than anyone who's, who's standing in the corner trying to disappear. Yeah. So that there's nothing to be ashamed of from those years, as many as they were for me. Uh, it was just when I, when I realized, no, this is, this is just about being there, being real and being generous, generous and open with your feelings. That's, you know, the hardest uh, barrier to overcome mm -hmm. you know I'm sure there are some people who are born that way <laughs> or, yeah. or were brought up uh, that way um, most of us are brought up to, to be a little less open a little more reserved a little more conservative with how we express ourselves mm -hmm. and that just has to be overcome I, I wonder you bring that up. Did, did you feel some of that from your, you went to a Catholic school. Did you feel like that informed a lot of your earlier work, that type of upbringing? Not the Catholicism so much. No. Okay. It's a funny thing to, to, to consider what our generation went through. Mm. Um, my generation of course was prior to yours, but uh in the 50s and the 60s, children in America 
were encouraged to do one thing well, and that was fit in. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be like everybody else because that's how you got friends. That's how you found a proper mate and that's how you got ahead in business and everything. Mm -hmm. And the boomer generation took that to heart. Mm -hmm. We became ourselves in a way that our parents recoiled from. <laughs> I mean, we were ourselves to a degree that they found appalling, but it's what we were taught to do. I think our parents' largest fear was that we would be oddballs, not be liked mm -hmm. by our peers, you know, even, even be too academic to be well liked by other people. So they pushed us in that direction. It was a deliberate attempt to make us normal. <laughs> yeah. And what we became was something more than normal. Mm. We became revolutionary. Ah. You know, we found our own way. We found their ways to be stultifying and um, unattractive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do, I don't think, it, I think it had more to do with that than, than with Catholicism. Um, I think it was just the, the time that we grew up in. Mm. Um, and it's probably, in a sense, that way for every generation. You have individuals who, who are expressive and yeah. impossible to <laughs> uh, suppress. I mean, my first grade teacher was always telling my mother why I, you know, why I was kept after school four days out of five. She said, Chris just has to share, you know. He can't shut up in class. <laughs> That's the way it was. Yeah. Huh. When you when you got to New York, how long had you been acting by that point? For, for when you were, went back to school to learn about computers and stuff, and oh. that brought you to New York. What what time period? That was that? well. That was uh, in eighty three. Mm -hmm. I you know I graduated high school in sixty nine and went to Steamboat Springs to work with a, a troupe of uh, actors from my college. Mm. Uh, but then I left that and went to work for the health department because it was a good job, <laughs> mm. you know? I could make some money for a change. I mean, I had, when I left college, my outstanding student loan was $500. <gasps> But it took me about eight years to pay that off because oh, I was man. making no money at all. Um, wow. But it was a different time, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, like, yeah. $500, I would have killed for that in student loans. Not <laughs> yeah. literally. Don't, don't, don't send your angry tweets at me, but yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I'd continued to, to act. I mean, I can't even piece together all the things. Uh, it was just, it was kind of an occasional thing. I would I would uh, either audition or or uh, meet up with some friends who were doing a show, something like that. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering when you got to New York, you were studying um, computer software development, something along those lines. What were some of the things that you had to peel away through with Dennis, your acting teacher, that started to really make you feel like what you were doing was more authentic, I guess. Yeah. Well, an example of how he would, he would uh, coach a person, mm -hmm. you know, we, because we were, we, we were always trying to put together monologues for auditions. And uh, so we would take turns, you know, there were maybe 10 people in the class and it was a two hour class. We would get up and do, do a monologue and, and then he would coach us in, in how to improve it. But uh, what I remember best is uh, I would do, I would begin a monologue and get about 15 seconds into it and he would say, stop. 
to close your eyes. I want you to start over, but I want you to speak slowly, as slowly as you can. Keep your eyes closed. So I'd close my eyes and I'd start to speak slower. I'd slow down. And within a short time, I would find myself overcome with the emotions that were in the words I was saying. A thing that I previously had been speaking too fast to connect with. You know, I thought I knew what the emotions were. I thought I knew where the speech was going. I thought I, you know, had it all mapped out. But I hadn't. I hadn't connected even with the first sentence because I was thinking about the third sentence or the fifth. And doing this, I mean, I recall one, one monologue, I don't remember what it was from, but uh, standing there with my eyes closed, saying the words very slowly without any expression, mm -hmm. I found myself in tears within 20 seconds. And, you know, he would stand up, he would come to the front and say, I'm going to touch you. Okay. And he put a hand on my chest, another hand on my back. Mm -hmm. And I would suddenly break down in tears. And by training, this kind of training, he showed me where the emotion was in the words I was saying. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't where I thought it was. It wasn't where my brain told me it was. It's where my body told me it was. And it was a revelation. He wouldn't give any explanation after that. He would just have me come back next week and do the do it again. But then, you know, this next time I would do it, I would know what he was after, what he was getting at. That the emotion is all in the words. If if a if a play is properly written, if, it, mm -hmm. if the playwright is good, and you shouldn't be doing any other work. The emotion is all in the words, and it's all ours. It's our legacy. As human beings, we are heirs to all of those emotions. Yeah. We don't have to find dramas in our own life to fill in the emotions. We know what they are. You can get it just by reading fiction. You know, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. read uh, Madame Bovary or anything, you know why those characters feel the way they do, and you feel it. And that's what he gave me mm -hmm. as, as uh, a new focal point for my acting. Mm -hmm. Was simply look, focusing on the words, finding the emotion and letting it come out of me instead of playing it. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that was like an empathy technique? I, I, I hesitate to give a name to it mm, okay. because uh, he didn't call it anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't call it a method or a technique or anything. This was just something everyone, he felt everyone had within themselves. It was yeah. the ability to connect to an emotion and to use a text to connect to an emotion. Um, and it made all the difference for me. Yeah. From, from that point on, how do you feel your acting changed? Well, it became, became much more rewarding for me. Mm. It was a revelation to, to, to see 
that I did not need to use a story from my own life in order to feel an emotion that the character I was playing felt. And I had seen a lot of examples of people doing that. People who would perform a part that involved a lot of pain, a lot of anguish. And at the end of the night, be unable to talk to you. Mm. Because to get there, they had to put themselves through some kind of hell mm -hmm. that they had experienced in their life. Yeah. And it dawned on me that that's not necessary. I mean, mm -hmm. how does any actor play Medea, for example? How does any actor access the emotions of a woman who has killed her two children mm -hmm. out of revenge against her husband who's been unfaithful? Mm -hmm. Who has experienced that? Almost no one. Yeah. And if they have, they shouldn't be on stage. Yeah. But the emotion is there. It's part of a, a, a legacy we have as a species, as by, by virtue of the fact that we have a language, we have a shared culture. Um, and that is all you need. You don't need the actual experience of going through a traumatic, cataclysmic event in your own life mm -hmm. in order to know what that feels like. That's why we have literature. That's why we have theater. That's why we have the arts to communicate the most uh, profound experiences, emotional experiences that, that, that human beings go through. Mm -hmm. And to do it without having to kill somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you've mentioned this a couple of times, this, this legacy, which when, when, you, when I hear you say it, it feels like there's a responsibility to the words that an artist, an actor has. Um, how to explain to me how you cultivated that sensibility for the, for the words. Um, well, primarily it was through the, the uh, work that I did mm -hmm. uh, with Dennis Moore, um, simply to, to treat the, the text as a kind of, well, it's a baseline. It's always a baseline. The text mm -hmm. is there. If, the, if a play is properly written, all of the things a character goes through are in the text. Mm -hmm. And to use one's imagination while saying the words to connect to whatever they elicit. You know, and, uh, my teacher, Dennis, was never, was never explicit about this. And in a way, I think I'm violating some unspoken code by trying to, trying to put it into words. Mm. Because what he did was to train us to do this. You know, he never lectured us. He never wrote anything down. We got what he was saying. And... I'm sure each of us interpreted it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We got what he was saying by what he told us to do and by uh, very judicious applications of contact. You know, like one time he got up, he said, I'm gonna do something now and it's not gonna feel good. And he pushed me in the chest so that I fell on my ass <laughs> and he said, how do you feel now? I said, I feel angry. I said, where do you feel it? And I scanned my body and I said, in my hands, which was an answer that was not intuitive to me. I would never have guessed that. Mm -hmm. But that's where I felt it. My hands were on fire. Mm -hmm. He didn't say another word about it. He said, 
start again. Wow. I remember um, when I was working with Sheila Tracer, and I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but it's still one of those those moments where it it just it just echoes in my brain, kind of hearing this experience that you had. Um, we were doing the chair exercise. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you you try and get it starts really uniquely in that it's one person and a physical chair and you try and get the chair to come to you and to do so convincingly and it, it, at some point you realize you're talking to a chair it's not going to move and it drives you kind of insane and then you put someone in that chair and they're still not going to get out and the, how that and then you're supposed to clock how all that kind of happens like the differences i should say between having a person physically sitting in the chair and then just talking to a chair. And then that evolves to where there is no chair and it's just you and this other person. And we were doing that over the course of many, many weeks. And the last time we did it, my teacher still was like working really hard with specific things that I was doing, predominantly balling up all of my emotion in my butt, like clenching my ass cheeks because no one could see my butt. I would flex that really hard. And and I still do to this day. I, I did it this week, in fact. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she had the other actor that was paired with me do the chair exercise, but hold me, like cradle me in their arms. And it destroyed me. I just started bawling my eyes out. And having to say the same lines over and over and over again, I, no, no. And yet them still like loving me and being gentle with me. It was really an eye-opening experience. And, and I think from that point on, the type of person I was and the type of actor I was going to work to become was vastly different from the presentational performer that I had been before that. It was always get memorized, hit your mark, and you know just look good for the costume, basically. Even though that was never the mindset, I always thought I was crushing it. And it wasn't until after this experience where that kind of changed for me. And the evolution of acting since then has been interesting in terms of like cultivating a process in that work. And, and then I guess... So just, did you turn that into a process that you use? I Yeah, I mean, to an extent, I think what it is is, I, I mean, a great example is this process now. I mean, I'm, we were working these monologues in front, of this, in front of a camera on our laptops at the beginning of this whole thing. And I'd say these monologues, and that's, I think that's being a little disrespectful to Jeffrey, these, these stories. We were working these stories in front of a computer and then trying to put that up in a in a milk house and then out in a parking lot and, and having the audience engaged, I, I, I felt like I was being extremely presentational all the time. And because I had to engage with the audience, I was much more aware of when I was putting on the veneer of a performer as opposed to trying to be more closely related in tempo and emotional pitch to Jacob Tepper and Frank. When I think it's when the audience is two feet away from you, you can see their response a lot clearer. And when you say the audience isn't going to buy it, if you're not, if you're just putting on the emotion as opposed to experiencing it yourself, and that's yeah. ab abundantly clear during this show. And I, I think from there, looking back over, and, and I know I'm doing a lot of talking now for this, but it's this last year, performance has been really weird. And there have been chunks where I felt like, okay, the game has passed me by. I think it's time to wrap it up, Sam. You're not very good anymore. And then I look back at the guy that was before that period of time, how I felt there was a, a progression of authentic 
relating to the character on stage that kind of got put on the back not just not not put on a back burner completely taken off the stove and my development is kind of plateaued and i don't know where i was going with that necessarily maybe i wonder do you feel like that's something that's happened or did you feel like once you got going on this project specifically i don't know if there was other shows you were involved in over the course of the pandemic did you feel like oh no there it is i'm right lot i'm back i'm back baby i know exactly what i'm feeling i know exactly what i'm doing well i think it, with any with any show there's a period where i feel like this is not right <laughs> you know mm -hmm. i'm not doing it i'm not hitting it it's just you know at that at a point like that i have to um in a sense start over go back to the text find everything in the text that i'm not feeling you know and just just feel it yeah make sure make sure that whatever there is in the text is in my delivery and that i'm open to whatever that brings up uh, it, there's a something that David Mamet said about that. He said, uh, you should not be putting anything into your performance that's not in the text. Of course, he's a playwright and he's a very proud one. <laughs> and what? he doesn't want to hear anybody putting anything into the performance that's not in the text. Yeah. He says, you should also not leave anything out of your performance that is in the text. Now, with a, with a good playwright, these are very wise words. You know, if the playwright is, uh, is Shakespeare or Shaw or uh, Strindberg or, you know, any of a number of great playwrights, yes, you should. You should know exactly what's in the script. And you should not leave anything out that the playwright put in there. And you should also not add anything. Your director might ask you to add something and then you kind of have to because they're in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and the director, of course, may cut several lines because uh, they find it tedious or something. So you're not always in charge of that, but it is, it is a, good, a good way to approach a script, particularly if you feel you're just not, you're not um, connecting with it, you're not getting it. Mm -hmm. It could be that, that you are censoring a script. You're censoring some parts of the script that you don't like, or you're jumping to conclusions about a character based on uh, um, mistaken uh, apprehension of some part of the script. So, yeah, my, I, I, as I said, I, I think in, the, in every show, there comes a point where I feel like I feel a blockage. Mm. I, can't, I can't quite get beyond this. It doesn't feel right. I'm not enjoying this. I don't like it. And uh, that, that's my solution is just go back to the script and become meticulous impeccable with the way you present the script and see if it doesn't get you past that yeah it's you're at, you're absolutely right i think there's this if the script is the backbone if it's our foundation when we're having those christ quote-unquote crises of self or ego or whatever it is that blockage however it's manifesting itself to kind of take a deep breath and then reconnect to the script itself, not your projection of what it should be. Well, what's actually- You should there. always be questioning what you thought the script was um, and rereading it, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, until you know what it is, yeah. I think. You've done a lot of this, uh, immersive theater right with the the catamounts well i've 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 had i've had the good fortune of being in the the most recent um westminster related shows but nothing on this scale nothing of this type of the, the golf piece 
which I, I'm afraid I didn't see. No. Um, were you in that? I was, yeah, yeah. I was talking to imaginary children the entire time. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a yeah. part. Yeah. An acting challenge. Oh, man. I was lucky, though. We had um, We had some children that were recorded and piped into a headset that I was wearing called a bone phone. And so uh -huh. at the very least, there were built-in points where the kids could interrupt or be involved in the story. Um, <laughs> I mean, and kind of prompt you to your next delusion. No? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it it was it was it was it was quite the experience in that regard. But I've never had to. I've never had to really be kind of involved so much with an audience before. Something this immersive is new to me. Wow. Yeah. It's, it, you know, one of the things it, it has been so funny is I, I've had these, these struggles of my ego and for those ghosties at home who know me very well, there is this, there's this arrogant man child inside my brain fighting it out with my better intentions almost all the time. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's it's funny how it manifests itself it, i'm glad that i'm aware that that is a struggle that wages within me but in certain instances it's it, it's it's where i have to do a lot of this work of like stepping back and reevaluating and and really taking the whole picture of what's happening around me and during this process while i've had that struggle of why am I still doing this if I feel like I'm such a shit actor right now? <laughs> where I've had the most rewarding experiences is where I have been able to talk to the audience directly. And like, and it's, so this is where I think it's, this is where it happens the most often. And it's, and it's funny to me, it's, but it's having a lot of the, the biggest response from the audience has been the why me segment where I'm, talking about why we're filling these bags and so on and so forth without giving too much away. And it it's felt it, it off the page, it feels saccharine, but there's, there's a heart to it. That's really cool to tap into. And a couple of times a night, I'm not so worried about the timing of it all. And I'm able to just kind of sit in it. And when I have the in in an in, in an immersive experience, more so than any other type of theater I've ever done in my life, I know exactly when and where I hook every member of the audience. And it happens every night. It happens every night. And that's one of the things that's really cool. You have a, a more difficult job than I in this play because you have to pay so much attention to your timing mm. you have to know by the time the first cow moves mm -hmm. where you're supposed to be and whether you have to speed up or slow down oh yeah oh i don't have any of those strictures because i'm kind of um well our our piece the piece that christine and justy and i do uh kind of stands apart from the the rest of the clockwork as it's going on um and however long it takes i mean if we took three more minutes than we did the night before then i'm sure we would get a note mm. but as far as uh 15 seconds 30 seconds it's not it's not a big deal so we can deal with, yeah. with uh, um, any contingencies that come up without having to think, well, do I have to cut that midsection now? Or... Mm. So I admire <laughs> you guys that, that have to, to have to take yeah. all that into consideration. And Yeah, I, I absolutely, I mean, me, Joan and Amelia are, 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 it's really cool when, when we're clicking in terms of our synchronicity, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's magical for, I will, I don't want to put words in their mouth. It's magical for me when we're synced up, and I'm dropping them off at the right time to Joan, and I'm mm -hmm. and I'm picking them up from Amelia at the right time. It's chef kiss. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. And for the audience, I I can't imagine the type of whirlwind of a ride that is, and how cool that must feel. 
Um, can you hear them uh, when you're when you're doing your scenes? Can can you hear them doing theirs or? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't hear Joan, but I can hear pretty much everything. Oh, Amelia she's inside does, so. the milk house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but she's but she's also got like a she's walled off and got two doors, so the sound doesn't travel yeah. from Joan's piece to mine. Uh-huh. But yeah, but like I'm sure Amelia can also hear every word I'm saying because I'm. I'm I'm magnified. I feel like I'm speaking into a megaphone inside that little room. Everything just kind of bounces uh-huh. off those walls, and, and no matter how quiet I'm trying to be, it's 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 has been a lot of fun. Um, I want to I want to steer back to something you had mentioned, w- without quoting it directly. Where do you feel that should? Let me rephrase it. Do you feel that that childlike ability to express yourself is still present at this stage in your career? Oh yeah, mm. um, it's the the thing I I cultivate the most. Mm. The uh, the make believe, as I put it, um, it's it's become more of a switch. Uh, because it is a natural ability. It's a natural, it's a, an ability that every child has that adults suppress. And if you, I don't know, maybe it's because I recognized it early on in my life and was able to, to switch back into it. Um, instead of putting up a, a you know a facade of a character that it beca- it's it's easy now simply to switch back into that and become you know feel like that I I uh, I can be another another character maybe it's a form of madness I don't care. <laughs> um, but it's it's like it's the thing I rely on most in this business. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else is kind of secondary to me. I mean, you have to speak loud enough to be heard. <laughs> you don't fall over the furniture. <laughs> don't eat too much before a show. <laughs> there are a lot of rules you have to follow. Hell yes, hell yes. Um, but uh, the. To to uh, and I don't even know how to put it mm-hmm. anymore, except that it's make believe. It is it is that that childish state of mind where you can switch your mind off and 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 put on someone else's. It's so much easier than acting, <laughs> mm. you know. Yeah, but it is acting. It, mm-hmm. It's the heart and soul of it for me. Does it ever feel like a chore? No, that part of it does not. Mm. Um, what feels like a chore is having to change clothes before and after a show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's my least favorite thing. <laughs> uh, what feels like a chore is uh, trying to get through a scene that you know is not working and you can't do anything about. Mm. But most of it is just a joy. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's a it's a privilege to think that people will come to to watch you for two hours, be somebody you're not. Uh, people give you the permission and approve of your spinning a a, a fiction on stage for them. None of that gets old. What do you think? Well, it's you know. It, you know, my, my favorite part of the day of performing is the second I hear that cowbell. I feel like I'm on, I feel like I'm on stage the second I hear that cowbell. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, and, and I have a very unique performance, if that's the case, because I hear that cowbell and I go to the outhouses <laughs> and I take care of myself so I don't have to worry about it during the show. And I and I still come out. I, I I go to the restroom in character. I come out in character, and all of that feels 
great. The performance feels great. When we're up on our feet in rehearsals, that feels good. I, I feel there's, for me over the last, especially over the last year, it, 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 there are aspects that feel like a chore. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I work through that. I think the reason why it feels like a chore though, is not anything that anyone else is doing. It's my own fears. It's my own doubts. Mm. I've been expecting, I've always tried to, so I came up in the theater as this, from a football athletic standpoint, mindset. I always had coaches, right? They would bark orders at you and you met those expectations and you went out and fucking did it, yeah? And then you got patted on the back if you were successful or you got chewed out if you didn't. When I became an actor, when I wasn't successful, the only person that was there to chew me out was myself. So I chewed myself out. And I've been doing that a lot this last go round. And one of the, and I, and I, and I think, I think that's what it is. I think I'm, I think I'm, I'm 37 years old and I'm tired of yelling at myself when things don't go right or I don't go the way I have expected them to. And what that's telling me is there's more work I need to do on my own before those types of feelings stop rearing those rearing their head during the process of putting on a show. That's where it feels like a chore. And, 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 and there's a part of me that's ashamed in admitting that because I still feel like I've just gotten started. I still feel like, thankfully, there is a great deal of theater and technique and moment to moment things and more about humanity that I need to learn. I mean, where I've gotten, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, when I see a performance, I see an actor perform and I say, I don't know how they do that. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a, a number of, there are a number of actors that, uh, that are a mystery to me because I can't, see any process um, behind what they're doing. And I'm looking very carefully, you know, because uh, these are very successful actors and I want to be a successful actor. And I, I uh, watch them carefully and I think there's just something deep inside them that spins this out. They've got a source inside them that that produces this. Yeah. And uh, you know, I want to cultivate that. I want to find that source because it looks so effortless. Yeah. It looks so natural. But for all I know, they're like the, you know, the geese on the pond, you know, they're paddling as fast as they can just to mm -hmm. look serene. Mm -hmm. Just like all of us, all of us. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good, that's a very good point. Thank you, Chris. I wonder as we get to this stage in the pod, what is that ghost light you wish was left on for you that you'd like to leave on for the next generation of artists coming up that piece of advice that you wish you had? Uh, well, I think this, is advice that applies to everyone, life itself. And that is simply to be kind to everyone, to be careful about what you say about anyone else, particularly if you don't know whether it's true. You know, mm -hmm. a, a careless word it's a small world, the theater. Even in a big city, it's a small world. And a careless word will travel everywhere before you even realize what you've said. I mean, that, this is not so much a, 
uh, advice to leave for actors, advice I wish I'd had. It's uh, advice I'm sure I heard when I was younger, mm. but didn't heed. It makes everyone's life better. Just, yeah. just kindness Absolutely. and respect, mm -hmm. you know? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been something that I think, I, I, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I think it's something that I've noticed has been missing in a lot of things. These mm -hmm. last, these last 15, 16 months, it's been. It's been a stressful time for everyone. Yeah. And it, it uh, of course, it's brought out a lot of ugliness in, in, mm -hmm. in people mm -hmm. that I'm sure they don't, they don't want to have associated with their name. Yeah. You know, but it's, uh, it's a very childlike response to to stress yeah you know when your comfort is suddenly being compromised by forces you don't even understand you know you 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 tend to lash out you tend to blame other people for it and i think our recovery from this is going to take a long time from this this pandemic and the whole political situation that was going on at the same time it's going to take a long time but it's going to make us better people yeah i hope it is because we if we don't become better people <laughs> then there's not much hope yeah no i'm with you on that for sure i cannot echo your sentiment enough i hope I hope we come out of whatever this last period of time and has been better for it. I am cautiously optimistic that that can happen in small doses. Mm. If that, if that sounds optimistic at all. <laughs> well, I think that's as far as I would go to. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, from the bottom of my heart of saying yes to being on my, my podcast. It has been an absolute joy to not sit, not just sit down and talk to you like this, but to share a, a dressing table backstage with you and a little whiskey here and there. Um, yeah. Thank you for my ghosties at home. The artist is Chris, Ken Chris Kendall. If you don't know, now, you know, Dan, do the damn thing. As I've gotten older, my 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 burps and flatulence has gotten more distinct to say the least. anyway well that's get... that right there is the sound bite that we're gonna put at the end of this pod oh god <laughs> music's gonna fade down a little bit <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh no do it that's fine do it i don't care <laughs> Thank you.